Good evening and welcome to tonight's Sweet Hour Talk Show program. We have yet another interesting show for you as we conclude our commemoration of Black History Month. My name is Coco Roberts and uh, I will be your co-host along with Brother Amadou Cole. Brother Cole? Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, again, we are back uh, with the Sweet Hour Talk Show. My name is Amadou Cole, a co-host of the Sweet Hour Talk Show. The Sweet Hour Talk Show is produced and disseminated by the media arm of New Breed. Grace Media Ministries. Uh, our purpose is to affect, uh, in a positive way, hopefully, uh, issues of spiritual, social, economic, cultural, and even practical relevance to our communities. And uh, of course, given the increasingly uh, globalized and interconnected world in which we find ourselves, our communities span both national and international boundaries. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we here at New Breed are in the process of celebrating Black History Month. And uh, to that end, the Sweet Hour Talk Show has launched uh, a series of programs that relate to the African American experience in the United States. Three weeks ago, Sunday, Brother Cesar Wilson uh, hosted uh, Mr. Wallace Bridges of the Fort Worth Independent School District. Two, Two weeks, weeks ago, ago Sunday, Brother Amadou Cole, who is hosting here with me, and Brother Dow Freeman, the newest addition to our show, hosted Dr. Emmanuel George, also on a related topic. Tonight's show, which was uh, initially uh, scheduled to run uh, last Sunday, was moved to today due to inclement weather conditions uh, in the Dallas Fort Worth area. However, uh, for tonight, justice and freedom in the civil rights movement will be our territory. And here to help us explore this very interesting topic, we have Officer Michael McCree of the Dallas Police Department. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Officer McCree. Thank you for having me. And uh, I feel that I will be uh, making a major oversight if I did not also mention that Officer McCree is an ordained minister of the gospel. So he is not just an authority when it comes to law enforcement matters, but he is also an authority uh, when it comes to spiritual matters. Now, uh, Officer McCree, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for, you, this is not your first uh, time visiting the show. You visited with us last summer, I believe, not long after the death of uh, George Floyd. And as a reminder, uh, George Floyd was the African-American man who died after a white police officer had knelt on his neck for approximately eight minutes. Uh, we thank you for appearing again, Officer McCree. Thank you very much. Now, uh, for those of our audience who have never met you before, um, and for those needing a reminder, why don't you uh, say a little about yourself, you know, by way of introduction, and perhaps, you know, give us a brief timeline of the progression of your career. Oh, absolutely. I'm originally from New York City. Um, after New York City, I graduated high school, went in and joined the military, U.S. Army. I uh, stayed in the, served in the U.S. Army for 10 years in the Army Infantry throughout the entire world, Korea, uh, Fort Hood, Texas, Colorado, Alaska. And after my journey in um, the U.S. military, I decided to go into law enforcement. I joined law enforcement in the Dallas Police Department in 2007. So, so I am currently in my 13th year as a Dallas police officer. Okay, uh, thank you for that very much. So uh, we are just going to uh, jump into uh, the questioning. Now, um, uh, Black History Month, uh, that, that phrase, when, when, when you hear that phrase, uh, what, what do you think of, what does Black History Month mean from, from your perspective? Absolutely, I, I appreciate that question because I want to start off by saying when you talk about black history, and you talk about the civil rights movement, and you have a law enforcement officer here, it goes hand in hand. Because there was a time in during the early part of the civil rights movement where law enforcement in pockets of this country was used to suppress that movement. Now that I'm a law enforcement officer, I look at myself as someone as a guardian. So as I think about Black History Month, what it means to me, and why we should celebrate it as all Americans, it's a time of reflecting, it's a time of remembering, 
And to me, it's a time of honoring those that came before us, that fought for us, but we can be in the position that we are right now. So we can have a platform to do what we're doing now. Amen. So we can have everything that um, that American dream that we see on TV, we can be entitled to that. And, and I think Black History Month, and I'm mean, not just for all Americans, for all Americans, just as a remembering of what happened so we don't repeat the past. Yeah, I, 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 I also, uh, in addition to what you said, I also, I also uh, tend to uh, see Black uh, History Month as something that, that, that gives a uh, pride, not to just American Blacks, but to those of us who come from other parts of the Absolutely. world, because uh, uh, we consider Black Americans to be our brothers and sisters. Absolutely. So uh, whatever achievements that are made in the Black Americans' fight for freedom, and, and, and civil rights, we see that as our success as well. Absolutely, because you have to know where, where it started in order for you to know where you're going. You know, um, I think a lot of our young people, they just see the situation we're in now, pertain, not pertaining to the situation we once were, and have trouble seeing the progression that took place and the people that sacrificed in order for us to have the things that we have. But it's an ongoing battle, and, and, and it's something that, um, and we as Americans, I like to use that word Americans, <laughs> we're all Americans. We, we as Americans need to strive for and continue to remember, reflect, and honor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Officer McCready. So uh, on to the next question. Uh, what events started the civil rights movement and, and how did it inspire uh, the community of color? Well, if you think about the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement actually started in 1950. But what was the catalyst of what ignited it and what really got it going and bring it to the national forefront was a young lady by the name of Ms. Rosa Parks. Ms. Rosa Parks is for those of you who don't know, um, I would very I would strongly encourage for you to look up Rosa Parks if you're not familiar with her. Rosa Parks was a young lady on the bus who refused to give up her chair to a white gentleman and that really started the whole thing. It really started the, the uh, transit boycotts and it went on to other things. And it really put the civil rights movement on, in the forefront of, of the American public, it really did. Uh, when Dr. Martin Luther King seemed to, to, to be prominent in discussions about civil rights, but there are many other oh, civil yeah. rights leaders. Oh, absolutely. Even, even after him, I mean, we had the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Even though some might look at him as a controversial figure, um, we had uh, the Reverend R. Sharpton. Those who would kind of stand in the forefront. Some might look at them as very controversial. That's fine. You know, sometimes not everybody's going to agree with everything you got to say. You know, but we, there, there's been a lot of people who came behind Martin Luther King before, and, and came behind Martin Luther King who fought for civil rights. That is correct. That is correct. And uh, that, what brings to uh, what that brings to mind is uh, is is uh, uh, folks like uh, Malcolm X. Absolutely. Uh, Marcus Garvey, by the way, he was originally from Jamaica. Uh, in, yeah. In, in some in, in some ways, he and he and Malcolm X had the same uh, approach in some sense to civil rights, in the sense that they both uh, advocated uh, segregating, self-segregating. So uh, for, for Garvey, he wanted uh, blacks to self-segregate uh, and to form their own societies, uh, societies in which all of the factors of production, land, labor, capital, yeah. will be managed by black entrepreneurs. And, uh, and, 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 and Mark, Malcolm X right. uh, was for segregation as well, but he was he had a more militant yeah. approach. Initially uh, in his career, he did. He right. kind of he kind of towards the latter part of his career, he understood that because he celebrated the Muslim faith, and he understood there were also white Muslims. So he kind of integrated them into what he was what he was talking about. But that, that was the initial part of, of, of Malcolm X's um, of his platform. Yeah, and I believe uh, he, that, that transition came after he made a pilgrimage to Mecca, to that's Saudi right, Arabia. Right, yes, so when he came back, his worldview I mean, changed because he was very aggressive towards the whites, even whites that were, were advocating on his behalf. Yeah. He, uh, but when he came, that, you know, standing side by side with others, you know, yeah. that wearing the same color as right. others. Right. Uh, after that experience in, 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 in Mecca, when he came back, yeah, later in his life, that, that yeah, absolutely, absolutely changed him. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, uh, thank you for that. Now, um, what comes to mind when you hear the word freedom? Uh, and it's a two-part question. Uh, how will you decide the struggle of freedom in the uh, civil rights movement? When I think of freedom, I think of opportunity. 
I think of progressive. When I say progressive, I mean step by step. I'm talking about um, developing um, a continuation of what was once started. Um, we have to continue to move forward. Um, there's always going to be an element of any society that's going to try to suppress any type of progressive movement. Um, and, and it comes down to us, um, and I mentioned this before last time I was here, voting is a big thing. Oh my goodness, I can't stress enough. Voting, holding our politicians accountable, holding our own community accountable for the things that's going on in our community, and really just to be patient, step-by-step -step progression of, of where we want to go and have a vision of where we see ourselves in this country, where we see ourselves uh, as far as development amongst the African Americans. Because um, I look at the... Uh, the, 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 the police force around the country, and I see black police chiefs, I see black lieutenants, I see black mayors, I see black governors. So I'm starting to, so this is a progression that really, that I'm really encouraged about. And, and, and a lot of it also hope. Hope, hope, is, hope is a big thing. Hope, 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 is, hope is something that you have to have, because without hope, it, it, it hope turns to discouragement, and discouragement turns to a behavior that is irrational. That it tends to develop, that we don't need this country. That is correct. That is correct. Um, now, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, ended segregation in public places um, uh, and uh, ended, well, tried to end discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin. Um, now, uh, are there other legislative achievements? as a result of the civil rights movement that is besides this civil yes, rights act of yes, 1964. Yes, sir. There are other... No, no, no. Yeah, one, two, three. Okay. There is many, many, many more legislative acts. Um, you want to talk about the Fair Housing Act. Um, you want to talk about... There, 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 are, there are a lot of things that came about that the civil rights our rights act in 1964, and in addition to other acts that came a little bit after, like I said, the Fair Housing Act, um, uh, bank loans was a big thing. African Americans weren't allowed to get certain loans in the bank. Um, we're talking about schooling. You know, back in those days, they were busing. They were talking about fair people, but they were, they were busing that was going on. But but I think, the, to me, personally, the most important thing was the Fair Housing Act. Um, the, the Fair Housing um, was really important because it gave African Americans an opportunity to kind of grow into, you know, the opportunity, I should say, to grow and buy their homes, nice homes, move into certain neighborhoods, um, not get taken advantage of by slumlords or landlords that was happening back in those days. Um, so the Fair Housing Act is probably one of the, one of the, the, the big things. Um, so this, this progression uh, toward uh, toward more uh, of freedoms and civil rights for, for, for blacks in America. Um, are, you, are you satisfied with the pace of it? Do you think that we're moving at a fast enough pace? That's a good question. Um, I, I, would have to, I would have to say yes. And it is why I, I say yes. I would have to say yes. I, I, the friends that I've worked with, most of the friends that I've worked with, um, and I, and, I, and, I, and I can only go by the journey of my life. You know, the opportunities that I had and the people that have helped me along the way. And, and, and a lot of more white people. And a lot of people gave me opportunities as white people. And I didn't ask for anything special. I just want the same opportunity that everyone else had. If I see a home that I want to purchase and I could afford it, I want that to be the only reason why I can make it. In other words, you want a level playing field. I want a level playing field. I don't want no advantage. I don't want nothing. I don't want to say, when I sat down with the police department and they handed out those tests, I wanted to take the same test that everybody else does. I didn't want no handicap. I didn't want anything. Um, I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of African Americans buying bigger homes, um, moving into nicer neighborhoods. I'm starting to get in positions of the prominence. We just had an African American president. And now we have an African American vice president. I mean, it's very difficult for me, in all honesty, to say that things are moving too slow. I think it might be moving slow, but it's not moving too slow. When we just elected a female African American vice president, you know, it's very, it's very hard. But, but we have a long way to go. We still have a long way to go. There always has to be progression. Don't get this step by step. Because I said before, there's always a certain element. Pocket, the population, population who's going to resist that. Mm -hmm. 
and, and if they're, they're going to resist that, they always have to be something to counter that. that. So, so they, they always have to be um, someone along the way that's helping this push this train forward, forward. that's keeping them forward. But, but I think progression is, um, in my journey, like, I, I think it, I've had a lot of opportunities. And, 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 I, and I took it upon myself to take advantage of those opportunities. And um, so my answer has got to be, yeah, that's a good thing going on reasonable okay. So, <laughs> just a uh, true question, do you think, Officer uh, uh, McCreef, do you think that we're going to have equal opportunities when it comes to uh, job creation, schooling, uh, getting the loan from the bank, and, and so forth? That, 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 that is something that, um, that, that the progression has to continue. It, it, it has to continue. Um, if you look at some of our schools, I don't know if you've been to some of the schools in Dallas, they're, they're in very poor cool shape. Um, and you look at some of the schools in other communities, they're in very good shape. Now, a lot of it has to do with tax dollars and, and, um, and things like that. But there, there is something, and, and the most important thing, and I keep going back to this, is we have to hold our politicians accountable. And we have to hold our politicians accountable to one another like us. And that's, that, that's very important. Um, and there's things that have to be addressed. So if the civil rights movement or the Black History Month don't do anything else, it's an opportunity for us to address certain things that's going on in the black community as far as schooling, getting jobs, having opportunities um, in schooling. The only problem is you can't legislate somebody's feelings. You see what I'm saying? You know, that's a very good observation. You can't, you can't because um, you can you can have all the policies put in place, but if you're if you're someone who's sitting in a seat of authority who is handing out jobs, there's no one watching over him for him to look at that application and just throw it in the trash. You see what I'm saying? So we have to continue to kind of push forward and and um, and do that. Uh, do you, well, we're going to go to uh, break uh, just after. I'm just, I just want to ask a question that came to mind as you were, you were speaking. But after this, we're going to go to break. And then when we come back, uh, Brother Amman Cole will uh, acknowledge some of our viewers. And uh, he will continue. We will resume the interview with our guests. Now, we just, as you mentioned, we just had, uh, we just had uh, uh, an African-American president, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, however, it seemed to me that racism is worse than it was before President Obama came into office. Uh, it, this image is something that uh, is, you know, in my mind, I'm pretty sure it's not, but um, why would we call this, why would we call this progression or moving forward if even after an African-American man has been made president, racism is on the increase. It, it, it seems that way. It, it, it seems that way because I think it's always there. I don't think it's got any worse or anything. I think it's always there. I think what happened was there's a there's a pocket of the population in this country that made it that made people feel more comfortable coming out of the closet, so to speak, coming out of the shadows. You know, people are just more comfortable saying certain things now that they wasn't back in the past. And now that Barack Obama became a big this country while he was president, I think, in my personal opinion, that it kind of made some pocket, small part of this country, and then all it takes is small pocket. Really. Small part of this country made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. And there's a lot of people that tried to suppress that. And, um, and so I think it was always there. I think it was always there. I think people just... People just more they got emboldened. They got emboldened. That's what I'm looking for. People became more emboldened to say that. And if you look at uh, the time, Barack Obama is a black person. He was there as a president, so he was between the scissors. Not because he's black, so he just turned to the black people. He was the president of the United States of America. So it came to a point that he just got uh, she was so confused or in a state of dilemma because of frustrated. Frustrated. frustrated because during his, his regime there were a lot of activities going on where black being killed and a lot of stuff so he could not just come and say okay I'm going to take the side of the black where do you leave the white where do you leave the Hispanic and, and, and other people of color so he was just he, he used wisdom to, to 
to, to lead this country. country. It may seem ugly to other blacks because most of the time I listen to Barack didn't do a good job, but I think personally he did. He did an excellent he did, he did an excellent job under the circumstances. And and I think what concerned a lot of people that was against him was that he didn't fit the stereotype. He was well educated, he was well spoken, he was good looking, he was a family man, he had good looking children, he had a good looking wife. And, and I, I think, think when people see that, they're like, wow. You know? You know. <laughs> <laughs> what else could I say about yeah, yeah. this guy you, other than attack his policy? There is no fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's nothing to work with. <laughs> nothing, to, nothing to work with, no. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you for that, Officer McCree. Yes, uh, we will now go to uh, a break, and uh, afterward, as I indicated before, when we return, uh, Brother Amadou Cole will resume the interview after he has acknowledged some of our viewers. So, uh, media, please take us into a break. This was the historic scene depicting a worthwhile venture of service to humanity as is expected by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As Christians all over the world gear towards celebrating the birth of Christ, the New Breed Grace Baptist Church added a holistic meaning to the celebration. Hundreds of cars lined up the streets stretching over a distance of 600 meters hours prior to the food distribution at their 2001 Oakland Boulevard location. The event was filled with excitement by congregants of the church, knowing fully well that they were accomplishing what the season of Christmas represents. As so high media approached the facility, men and women, boys and girls were busy ensuring that the purpose of their presence, which was to dent a smile on the faces of others, was accomplished. As the COVID pandemic continues to unleash devastation on American families, the Newbridge Church leads a frantic effort in making sure that its presence of service is felt in and around the community. Speaking to the senior pastor of the church, Pastor Joseph Numa, this is what he had to say to us. Today is all about food distribution. We are not distributing food if you are in the neighborhood, no matter where you're from, regardless of which region of the world you are from. We are here to serve humanity, especially in times like these. We will all get through this thing together. COVID-19, we are going to beat it, but we can only beat it when we come together as a community, as a nation, and as a people. I am glad to be here today with my church members. We are leading by example. We are serving humanity. And if there is anything you can do to join this massive campaign that will continue every month from today, you are highly welcome. You are highly appreciated. And we are looking forward to joining us, or better yet, if you know anybody who is in need, tell them, you don't need anything whatsoever, just come out and receive. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you all. As a church with mostly an African demographic constituent, this must be a day of pride and fulfillment that this demographic makeup can also add to the spiritual and socioeconomic development of the land that has given them a second chance. As members of the church worked tirelessly, to deliver a divine expectation. Volunteers saw the need also to help in achieving this goal. What pushes, what pushes you to, to volunteer? Because I love serving the Lord. And uh, how does that make you feel? It gives me joy to give to others. To others. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says to love one another as He has loved us. In fulfillment, of one of the greatest commandments, loving your neighbor as Christ loves the church, is one of the single biggest reasons why the Newbury Church undertakes this venture. Today is having to be a great day, just like around Christmas, there are lots of stuff going on, people are hungry, and our government officials and other people are putting politics ahead of the interest and welfare of the people to represent. So I'm happy to be part of God's family today that we can come out here to carry on food distribution, you know, for our community and our people. So wherever you are, if you are watching this video, come out, we do have food over here. It's for you, it's for the community, and we are happy, you know, to do this. And, you know, we just want to be grateful to God for the strength and the service to be able to help the community. So come out and help us serve, get your food, and, you know, go and enjoy. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you and your family. Loving and nurturing your flock, and now the community, 
exemplifies the kind of love that Christ has for all of his children. This is So High Media, wishing you all a Merry Christmas. This is Soar High. Again, we are back. This is a Sudaba talk show. It is a result of the media department of the New Progress Baptist Church here in Fort Worth, to be precise, 2001 Oakland Boulevard, Fort Worth, Texas, 76103. Tonight we are discussing justice and freedom in the civil rights movement, and our guest is Officer Marco McCree. On this show, we highlight the roles of the church in the community. We transform the views of our Christian community. We also promote community-based initiative for Christian and humanitarian development. We discuss issues surrounding the growth and the well-being of our community. Uh, we will begin acknowledging our many viewers before we move forward with our interview. Here we have Ms. Oliva Swag Gibson, Ms. Laura Ray, uh, Ms. Larry Ricky, she's one of uh, the members of this show. They are all watching. But we, we have two sides. We have the Sweet Hour Talk Show and then we have the New Brooklyn Baptist uh, Church side. We go on next side, we have Ms. Mama Trisha Rabot, she's watching. That's the wife of Mr. Coco Rabot, the co host. Mr. Sammy Dennis is also watching. We have Ms. Kuma Sa, Kuma Joanna Sa is watching. Miss Aniko, oh, that's my one. <coughs> we have Bishop Thomas Mana, great show. He <laughs> commanded the team. And we have Miss Candy Love, she's out of state. Good evening. Good evening, Candy, wherever you are. We have Mr. Aaron Cooper, he's also watching. Mama Treasure, or Robert, we have Aaron Cooper, he's a free locomotive of people of color. Okay, okay. <laughs> Vane Cohen is watching as well. We have Bishop Thomas Mana. He said the officer touched some good stuff. Officer McCree, that's a compliment from Bishop Thomas Mana. And these are our views so far that we have just acknowledged. Again, if you just tune in, this is a sweet hour talk show. It's an exodus of the leader department of the New Brooklyn Baptist Church here in Forward. Tonight we have Brother Coco Roberts who introduced the show and started with the interview and then we have Mr. Marco McCreve. He's an officer of the Dallas Police Department. He's been here before. So Officer McCreve, let's just get into uh, our interview. Our next question here is say, which civil rights leader? Because earlier on, uh, 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 Brother Coco Rabo said, well, there were a lot of activists, but then Dr. Martin Luther King just overshadowed everyone. Probably that was the anointing of God. <laughs> yeah, you don't know. But our question is, says, which civil rights leader do you think impacted the struggle of blacks for civil rights the most? Obviously, you know, you can't go without saying Martin Luther King, obviously. You know, he's a, a historic figure, um, well-known uh, throughout the world. Everyone in the world knows he's in the history books. Um, we have a holiday after him. You know, so it, it, the easy question is Martin Luther King. But, but I have to go back, and I say this because I'm, I'm really from New York City. Um, I have to go back to Reverend Mr. Jackson. I, I have to do that. He's not in the forefront these days because, you know, he's getting older. Um, he's, he's a controversial figure to some people who disagree with him. But whenever there was, and, and I appreciate, I, and I say this, is because whenever there was something that took place that was traumatic to our community, whether it be in New York or other parts of the country, he was there. He was there leading peaceful marches. He was there, he was there leading peaceful sit-ins. He was there saying the right things. He was, he was, he was, he was for the forefront of what was going on uh, during that movement and the time that it was um, at the time when there was a lot of tensions between the police department and the black community, he was always there. Him and the Reverend Al Sharpton. I go to those two, and I, I like to stick with those two. Um, since then, there's been certain people that that come about, but not as prominent as those two. I would have to say. Uh, uh, Coco, for you, what, what were you saying? Um, <clears throat> well, 
Which one, which one of the civil rights law law impacted, law according to the question, impacted the black for civil rights uh, uh, the most? Which, which, one, which one of them? Uh, I would say that Martin Luther King had the most impact. Um, but uh, I, I think, as I mentioned before, that other civil rights leaders uh, were also significantly helped you know, in this, uh, in this fight for civil rights. So I, I think that there was a place for each of those leaders. So for example, uh, Martin Luther King with his, with his nonviolent direct action, uh, where they were asking the question, uh, are you able to, to, to receive beating and not retaliate? Uh, uh, that, that, is, that is correct. And, and, and uh, uh, Malcolm X used a different approach. He said, he said that um, uh, a fight back, protect yourself by any means necessary. So do I think that uh, there were some would-be attackers that were deterred from attacking Malcolm X's people because they, they, they knew that they would have had a fight on their hands? Certainly. And I think that um, uh, certain types of people, uh, uh, this movement, his movement appealed to, and, and certain other types of people, King's movement uh, appealed to. But I, I, I do think that, you know, the underlying common denominator of each of those leaders is pride, black pride, racial pride, uh, uh, you understand? And uh, uh, I, I, I hold him in as high an esteem as I do Martin Luther King, to be completely honest with you. But to answer your question, Dr. King has <laughs> Yeah, that Martin Luther King, uh, Jimmy, uh, uh, you, you know, he, he, he was a preacher and yeah, God used him, the Lord spoke to him. Unlike most of the other civil rights activists, they were not really involved with God being the forefront, but most of the time God spoke to him, God used him. And I just believe it was the anointing of God, and God really used him. So I will classify him as the Godfather of the civil rights movement. I'm glad you reminded people. I'm glad you reminded people that Martin Luther King was a preacher. He was he was an ordained. He was ordained. He was a reverend. And and I think that's important for people to know, especially us as Christians, that what what needs to come out of the black community as far as leadership is the leadership of the church. And, and that, that is very important because I think um, the pastors and the ministers, they have the ears of the people. And they have the ears of the people. Not only can they express the godly way of, taking, of doing things, amen, but they have, they have a way of, of, of charisma and charm and, and a way of bringing people together to make change. And, and, and I think that if, any, if anybody, you know, we talk about politicians, politicians can be manipulated a little bit. Even, you know, but, but, but I, I believe our black preachers are, are the ones that can really step up and take it. We have a lot of prominent black preachers in this country, you know, that speak to thousands of people on any given Sunday. And I, I think they, they, they can have an impact in what's going on in this society. I think, you know, now we have athletes that are stepping up, which, which is fine, you know, but I really would love to see more African American preachers come to the forefront and, and discuss what's going on in this country. Thank you, Officer McCurry. Uh, our next uh, question here. So, uh, do you think that marches, sit-in, and other demonstrations help or hurt the movement? If it help or hurt the movement, how? You know, I am um, working out there in the Dallas Police Department. I got to see first-hand marches, peaceful marches. I got to see first-hand citizens, and they're effective. They're effective for one thing. Number one, you can't oppress everybody. That's number one. And I say that you can't oppress everyone because the, the peaceful marches, what they do is they build coalitions. When I was watching these peaceful marches, I didn't see just black people. I saw Hispanics. I saw a lot of white people. So it's a building of coalitions because contrary to popular belief, most people want to live in peace. Most people want change and they want it to come about in a peaceful way. So I think sit-ins, marches, as long as they're peaceful, I think as long as they're peaceful, I think it's very effective. Once a march, once, you're, once you try to fight for change and it turns violent, you can kind of lose that coalition. Because I remember work, working downtown and I was talking to a, 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 a white gentleman and he was in a march just walked by and the march stopped 
and they were venting their frustrations at a, at a restaurant that had been seen. And there was a lot of white people that were sitting there. And it was peaceful. They were just venting. And after the march moved on, the, the white gentleman came up and talked. He said, you know what? What they were saying was great. And I was, I was really listening. And I was like, you know what? That's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. The moment somebody in that crowd started throwing out threats, he said, that's when we lost them. That's when we lost them. So, in a sense, it's easier for people to listen to you when you're not threatening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when they're not afraid. So, peaceful marches, yes, they're, they're very effective. And, and, and first, because they feel coalitions. More people are in for peaceful marches instead of when they want to, when they want to bring about change and what's going on. Is that something you want to add up? Oh, he said it all. Uh, no, no. Oh, oh, okay. All right. All right. I saw you looking and said, well. Oh, our next question of uh, McCree. What are your thoughts on the assassination of uh, Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Yes, I mean, what, what can you say other than, other than tragic? Um, unfortunately, um, the deaths of Martin, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King had to bring about change. Um, initially, it sparked violence with Martin Luther King's assassination. Um, but it really, you know, I hate to call them martyrs. Um, I hate that word because it's like, they, 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 he did die for a cause, he did die for something, he didn't die for nothing. But it really put in the forefront the outrage. It really put in the outrage of, of how violent people can be that wants to oppress you, that wants to stop whatever movement you're, 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 you're trying to progress. And, and like I said, it, it, it's tragic. It's hard for me to articulate it because I wasn't alive at that time. <laughs> you see, I, I, I couldn't feel the impact because I wasn't alive. But as I got older, I started learning about Martin Luther King, started watching the videos, and then I said, okay. But it's, it's hard to really articulate what impact you on somebody's death when you weren't alive during that time. You understand what I'm saying? Again, it's just Tony. This is the Sweet Hour Talk Show, uh, an observer of the media department of the New Brooklyn Baptist Church here in Forward. Tonight, we are discussing justice and freedom in the civil rights movement. And our guest here is Officer Malcolm McCriff. He's um, a police officer of the Dallas Police um, uh, Department. And along with me, I also have another young man, Mr. Coco Rabot. He's a co-host for the show. This guy is very talented. He's always <laughs> making us to, to get sound. And every little good thing you see is uh, Mr. Coco Rabot. We have him up tonight. Uh, to our many viewers, we just like to remind you, March next month, the most watched, uh, the most viewed individual will be receiving a gift card. Remember that. So March, the month of March, we're coming up with uh, that uh, price. And I know the guys that are in charge, they have already identified the person because that was from last year. So, uh, Officer Macron, we're going to go to break, but we just throw in one last question when before that, and we go to break, we'll resume, but Coco Rabba going to take it um, from this end. Uh, what was the significance of the freedom song, We Shall Overcome, to the Civil Rights Movement? And what your thought uh, on nonviolence? You know, um, that song, We Shall Overcome, was originally a gospel song. A lot of people don't know that. But I, I think as someone adopted it and put it as the theme song or the encouragement song of a, of a certain movement, um, whenever I hear that song, when I was hearing that song, as I watch videos of the civil rights movement, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a song that encourages hope. Not hope just in the Lord, <laughs> but hope in what's going, where he's going to bring us out from. You know, without hope, it, it's a dangerous thing without hope. You know, so, so that, that, that song originally was a gospel song, and the civil rights movement adopted that song as, a, as an encouragement to get people to say, we can, we can do this. We can overcome in a peaceful way. You know, you can force things to happen, you know, um, violently, but does it last? Can you build a coalition? No, Martin Luther King always talked about changing the hearts and minds of the people. Not, not, not scary people, changing the hearts and minds of the people. And, and, and that, I think that's what that song really means. It's a song of hope. It's a song of hope and, and what's going on at a certain time. I mean, even these last couple of days, 
uh, with, the, with the weather the way it was, and I reached out to a lot of people, and we were in situations where money could get us out of it. Um, we were in situations where I couldn't get to people. So the only thing I could do was offer home. The only thing I could do was offer home. You know, I'll, I'll hear for you. I can't get to you. Even if I send you money, I, it's not going to help you. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You're in your hotels, and you're, so you're stuck where you're at. So the only thing you can do is continue to get you home. We're going we're gonna to get through this. We're going to get through this. That's what that song is. How can we go to uh, turn to our uh, media department for a short break when we resume? Brother Coco Rabba going to take the next section of this uh, show. Media, it's up to you. Hi guys, this is Narapan on African Market International Grocery Store, situated at the corner of Highway 26 and Glenview, address 7109 Boulevard 26, North Richland Hills, Texas, 76180. At Narapan, we also offer clothes and custom jewelry for weddings and families events special order custom african jewelry nakwana carries labyrinth products jamaican mexican middle eastern kenya tonga togolese congolese and just name it we also have organic seafood meat seasoned vegetables and much more nakwana is an african market that you would love to shop from. We now enter in the store at Narpa now. We have crayfish, we have beans, maggie cube, boning. Oh, these are pretty much good items. We have plenty of pineapples, we have okra, onions. You look on our right here, we have uh, parboiled rice, we have vera tabs, we have the big bag, we have the boxes. We also have the sorbet oil. We I want to show you on this end in our refrigerator we have dry fish, we have kidney, uh, we have some frozen spinach. Oh, there are a lot more. We have you have palawa sauce, and you just name all of the items that we have over here. This is another area where we have uh, the owner of this business, Miss uh, Koma J. Sa. She's waving out there. We have on the uh, eye ahead of us, we have palm oil. We have uh, soda. You don't have to go to Liberia to purchase you uh, soda. We have it here. So we need you to come at Nakwana. This African market is situated at the corner of Glen and Highway 26. To be precise, 7109 Boulevard 26, North Richland Hills, Texas, 7618. Zero. On the left side here, we have palm butter. This is canned already. It's much more safe as you that are out there that love safe item, safe products. We have them there canned. We have peanut. We have plenty. Again, Again if you're just tuning in, this is the Sweet Hour Talk Show. Uh, an exoteric, uh, a media, uh, an exoteric of the media department of the New Brooklyn Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We are going to acknowledge our viewers uh, from there, but the Coco Rabbers will take it from this end. We have uh, Minister Lady Ricky, she said, good job, New Brooklyn's Global Ministry. As a matter of fact, that's the, uh, the, the original name of New Brooklyn's Church in New Brooklyn's Global Ministry. Lady Reiki also said, Lord Irene is watching from her hospital bed. We wish you speedy recovery, ma'am. She's at the hospital right now. Even when her strength is weak, she continues to support. Praise God. Um, uh, Minister Reiki, the Reverend Jesse Jackson has done great things for our people. I remember being a little girl in the early 80s, listening to him speak to a group of people in West Dallas, Texas. I was there listening, watching, and learning. His speech helped mold my 
thinking as a woman of color, he has always held my attention. Lord, I read history right today. Oh, let's move to the Newbury Grace. That was a sweet hour talk show. Let's move to a Newbury Grace um, side. We have uh, Pastor Joseph Yuma. He's the lead pastor of this assembly. He said, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. preaches non-violence and said in his famous speech that he dreamed about a nation where his children won't be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And there's more reading. By the content of their character. Honorable guests, how will you describe the current state of affairs wherein race has become the lens through which an individual is judged? That's a, that's a, that's a very powerful question. Um, unfortunately, um, and I'm going to say this, and I don't want you to take it the wrong way, but race is always going to exist. Some level of it is always going to exist. You're always going to have a pocket of a population that's not going to like you, regardless of what you do or what you accomplish because of the color of your skin. I think where we at now, I think with the African American vice president, um, a president who was Barack Obama, he represented himself well. He represented himself well. And I think that's the best thing we can do as African Americans, despite your profession or what you do. Once you represent yourself well at your occupation or whatever you do, when people get to know you of another race, they forget all about the fact that you're black. They tend to forget about that. You just, you're just who you are. And you're good at what you do. And you represent well. You're a Christian man. You're a godly man. You're a family man. So where we at right now, um, there's always going to be a pocket of people who's going to feel that way. But I think um, even when I do part-time security at a very large Fortune 500 company, and you see a lot of young African-American executives, when I look at them, I don't see them as black executives because they carry themselves so well. I look at them as just executives. Like, yes, sir. No, sir. You know, give them the same honorary and respect that I would give anyone else because of their position, not because of their fellow African-American. And so I think that's very important for us as African-Americans. As long as you represent your well, yourself well, people are going to judge you by that. Definitely. Uh, it reminded me when uh, our former president, uh, President Trump, challenged uh, the place of birth of President Barack Obama at the time. He had an option. He could refuse not to show birth certificate. But because he wanted people to judge him by his value, he went and while presented birth certificate. So he was thinking beyond. So, so Mr. Rabbit, we turn to you. <laughs> you take a show from us. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for that. So, Officer of McCree, um, the million, uh, sorry, the, watch, the, the march on Washington that was organized by Dr. King's movement uh, culminated into his delivery of the I Have a Dream speech. And this, this kind of relates to what uh, our pastor Joseph Yemen just asked on the live feed. Um, I believe the, uh, the, the exact uh, quote uh, from uh, Dr. King's speech was something like, uh, I have a dream that one day my four little children will live in a country where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Um, and of course, we know that he was talking about black people. That sure, absolutely. Absolutely. It was just a metaphor. Yeah. Um, how far toward realizing Dr. King's dream do you think we've come? I think we've come a ways. I think we have a lot, we have a ways to go, if that makes sense. We've come a ways, but we still have a ways to go. You know, if, if, you, if you think it's far from here to Dallas, and you get to Arlington, you say, I've come far, but I still have a ways to go. Um, we, we have a ways to go. Um, our schools are integrated. Um, society is more integrated, more integrated marriages. Um, as time goes on, and people become more integrated, people become in the workplace, in schooling, in the playground, in athletics, and everything. And more people become more integrated and begin to understand everyone else as who they are, not the color of their skin. I, I, I think we'll be in a, I think we'll, we'll be in a much better place. But we have a way to go. We have a way to go because as society starts to grow, as the new people start coming up, 
and you'll see less and less of that. You, 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 will, you will see less and less of that as the new generation comes behind us and the new generation comes behind them. I think that dream will be fulfilled at some point. It may not be in our lifetime, but it's upon us to continue to work towards that. And, and, and I think at some point, will are we there yet 100%? No, we're not. No, we're far from it. We are far from it. But like I said, at least we, we're benefiting from it. We're benefiting from it. And I'm going to tell you something, and I say this because I was so... Um, moved and then so struck by all the young white people that were involved in the peaceful protest of the George Floyd. Yeah. They were young people. So the, the, the good thing about them being young people is that they're going to teach their young people. And then they're going to teach their young people. And the next thing you know, you're going to have a society where people don't have that attitude. And, and, and I think we're moving in that direction. Yeah, no, and, and I, I tend to also look at uh, uh, Dr. King's speech as um, a speech in which he was not addressing everyone. He couldn't have been addressing everyone. I certainly do not think that Dr. King was 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 addressing hardcore racism or anything like that. Uh, I do believe that he was talking to, uh, he was speaking to that that portion, you know, of American society uh, for whom uh, uh, Jim Crow laws in general and. And, and segregation in, in particular, you know, uh, posed a, a real ethical and, 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 and moral dilemma. I think, I think he, was, he was saying to these people, uh, which I think was most Americans, uh, we're better than this. But what are your thoughts on that? And you know what, that's, that's a very good point. He could have been talking to the hardcore races. What are you going to say to this? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the Americans he was talking to that wanted America to be better. That's who he was addressing. He was addressing those people. He was addressing the hearts and minds and the morality of the people. But people could say, you know what? That is wrong. You know, regardless of what I was taught in the past, I'm a better human being. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in Christ. I'm a believer in God. And what's happening here is wrong. And sometimes people need to be reminded of that. Because sometimes we get in our everyday lives and we just go about our lives and put the shade on and pretend like there's nothing going on around us. But when somebody brings that up to the forefront, and somebody would put that in their face, so to speak, and just say, hey, here's what's happening, and here's why it's wrong. And I think the rational people, God, rational god fearing people, would tend to adopt that and say, you know what? It, 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 it is wrong. It is wrong with what's going on. And that's what changed coming out. So, so it was a, it was a, 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 a kind of moral it was challenge. Absolutely. You know, it was a moral challenge. Absolutely. You know, and say that we, 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 can't, we can't continue. Absolutely. This is why the non-violent movement was so this is why the movements gotta be. This is why the movements have to be nonviolent. People would not listen to you if they're afraid or they're feeling threatened. It's very difficult to do that. Most people want to live in a peaceful country. You you visited with us uh, last summer, as I stated earlier, uh, around uh, the time that George Floyd was killed. Uh, since that time, to any extent. Do you think that the situation has improved? I'm talking about in the last year since we saw you. I would say within the last few months, that <laughs> there's been a lot of change. In, in the change for the better, change, of course. Change for the better. And let and, and me explain a couple of things real quick. Um, there's been a lot of, we've received so much training since the George Floyd incident to ensure that that, that doesn't happen again. From things like de-escalation training, what I mean by de-escalation, if someone thinks, how to calm a situation down, even if you have to make an arrest, how to calm a situation down. Um, there are policies put in place to make it easier for officers to intervene when another officer is committing a crime, and also to hold officers accountable who don't intervene when another officer is committing a crime. And I think that is huge. And I think that is huge, you know, because if an officer sees something that's going on that's not right, it's, a, it's his duty. Not only is it, is it a moral obligation, but now it becomes his job to do something about it. And if nothing else comes out of the George Floyd situation, it's that. That's very impactful. I know the Dallas Police Department has put policies in place for that, and I'm, from what I've read, other departments have adopted that also. So um, a lot of good is going to come out of that. It, it really is. It, it, it's already started. You say, it's been, you know, it, 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 it's been in place now. Quite quickly, since it, and it all pertains to the movement, the peaceful movement, the peaceful movement. 
Okay, well, well, that is good to know. Uh, and uh, before we will be, um, we are running out of time, and uh, we will be ending the show shortly. Uh, but uh, I would like you to uh, give any final thoughts uh, that you have, if, if you do have something. I, I think um, I think we should continue to uh, support and to celebrate and to honor Black History Month. I think it's very important. You know, um, some people feel that there's no need that we're all Americans, but really it's about the history. It's really about the history and not um, repeating the history. To continue to move forward. I think Black History Month is a movement forward. It's a movement forward. It's a time of reflection. And whenever you're reflecting on something, you're, you're honoring it, you're remembering it, it's, 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 it's engraved in you so it doesn't happen again. So you can keep going forward. And I think for our young people, it's important to, for them to know the accomplishments of a lot of African Americans. Um, they can see it on TV, they can see the athletes, they can see the politicians, but they need to know there are black doctors out there, there are black scientists out there, there are black scholars out there. And it gives them hope, you know, it gives our young people hope to say, you know what, I could be a doctor, I could be vice president, I could be president of the United States. Before, there was a time when someone said that, they were like, and the child said, I want to be president of the United States. There was a time in our community that I was like, okay. 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 You know, there was a time in this country where a young person said, I want to be a heart surgeon like, 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 like Dr. Ben Carson. And we would tap, tap on his head, okay, yeah, not in this country. But no, that's not true anymore. You know, we, we have an opportunity. And, and it comes from home. And it comes from uh, the Black History Month. This is a reminder. It's a reminder of where we were, where we were, and what we can get to going forward. And and what I like about being a, what I, from the George Floyd situation and up to this conversation, what I like being a police officer is because I became a guardian. You know, there's a civil rights something going on. I can become a guardian of that. I can protect that. You see what I'm saying? And and, and that, that's very powerful. For me. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Brother Amadou Cole, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I would also love to encourage uh, the black in general uh, not to be a uh, racist, but every uh, race have their own lifestyle and have their own way of doing things. Uh, I usually go to the Asian market when I get there. You have a lot of Asian no other raise their work besides Asian. And sometimes people see it as a bad thing. I see I said, no, they try to help their own people. So if you feel offended as a Liberian, go and get uh, involved in business, hire other people. It's up to you. So I would love to encourage us black, instead of fighting each other, we can do a lot more, and the white not going to do it for you easily. You're going to do it by yourself. What, what you learn and what you decide to do is going to help you. So I see us fighting among ourselves. It won't yield any good. We need to what? put our differences aside and move forward, continue to make progress as we live in this developed country. This is the best country in the world. No country better than the United States of America. So, when you come here, there's an old man that told me, he said, this is the final bus stop. If you leave from here, you either go heaven or you go to hell. So, you're not going to go elsewhere to say, I, I, I'm So, I would love to encourage us black to continue to love one another, to hold together, and once we are together, we will succeed. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brother Cole. Uh, well, um, I saw a posting uh, from my wife a few days ago, uh, something about, you know, lifting black voices. So, so my final thoughts are somewhere along those lines. Um, I think that, as you said, we, we black should support each other, even if it's, you know, each other's businesses and things like that, because other races do the same thing. I think that, you know, during times like these, you know, during the Black History Month, we should try to do as much to, to magnify, you know, uh, the, the successes of black people, to magnify uh, the achievements of civil rights leaders, and we should do it, you know, with a sense of pride, with a sense of racial pride. What we want ultimately is for the younger generation 
uh, to adapt this, this kind of thinking, you know, going forward. As the others uh, said earlier, they will teach uh, their children, you know, uh, to have this sense of, uh, of racial pride about them. So, um, we are about to end the show. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, our, our crew here. Uh, like there are a lot of logistics and, and work that goes into these productions. And uh, we have a dedicated crew of people that, that see to it that uh, uh, all of this groundwork gets done. I'm included. Um, <laughs> who do we have? We have um, uh, Minister Ricky. Uh, she and uh, Mother Bloma Yuma are involved with interacting with prospective guests. And once, you know, a guest is free to come and see us, they stay in touch with that guest and make sure that, you know. Um, and they, they are doing a very good job. Uh, I want to thank them for, for everything they do. Uh, we have you, Brother Amadou Cole, uh, for a, a large, to a large extent, uh, the Sweet Hour Talk Show is, is somewhat of your brain child. You know, uh, Brother Amadou Cole has a lot of good ideas. Good ideas are always flowing uh, from him. Uh, thank you for everything you do, Brother Cole. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Dow Freeman, Brother Dow Freeman. The newest addition uh, to our crew, Brother Freeman is, is very brilliant, and he has he, he's, he's quick thinking. You know, he's, he's very quick. You know, uh, 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 on his feet, I should say. Uh, Brother Dow, thank today. Brother Dow is on the camera. I thank you uh, for everything you've done. Uh, then we have uh, Nathaniel Johnson, A.K.A. Kush, uh, who is not with us today, by the way. Um, Kush brings considerable technical um, expertise, technical knowledge to the show, whether it be, you know, in terms of operating systems, platforms, uh, software applications, or even physical hardware. Uh, Brother Kush Johnson is what I would call the uh, epitome of, of calm, quiet competence. Brother Kush, we are grateful for everything you do for this show. And then we have my own brother, Brother Cesar Wilson. Uh, brother Wilson is the leader of this crew. Uh, he has uh, amazing organizational skills. Brother Cesar is a natural leader. He takes all of our various efforts, he combines them, he weaves them into a, a coherent, unified package. Uh, you know, like a, like a maestro would, would, would do on a symphony orchestra. Thank you for everything you do, Maestro. And then, of course, finally, we have a last, but by no means least, uh, myself, Coco Roberts, technical producer, and tonight's co-host. Uh, on behalf of New Breed and the entire crew here at the uh, Sweet Hour Talk Show, we want to thank Officer Michael McCreevious again for gracing up us with his presence and uh, allowing us this, this session. Uh, and to you, our viewers, we thank you for spending this hour with us, and we encourage you to to uh, to to send us suggestions, to to post suggestions in our live feed, because we are always looking for ways to improve uh, the content of what we're putting out. So, uh, alternatively, you could uh, email shts as in Sweet Hour Talk Show at newbreedgrace that that org. You could email your suggestions to that address. So once again, uh, thank you for joining the Sweet Hour Talk Show, and uh, we hope you have a wonderful week. Have a good night. Awesome. All right. Um, I like that it's open to everyone too, because now we're in a modern world. You know, um, the internet and Facebook is, you know, awesome. My second question to you, Miss Gibson, is if you're ever, which I'm sure you are going to be, invited to the show, will you consider coming? Oh, yes, I will. Definitely, I will. Absolutely, I will. I will be, a, will be so happy to be a guest one day. Oh, thank you. All right, I know it will be soon. Um, my final question, I see you're rocking your new Brie Grace shirt. It says it's all about the kingdom. I'm loving it. Um, how would you describe this church in one word? Oh, in one word, I will describe New Greek Grace as loving. The church that is so loving. Amen. That's what I, I, I can tell you.
is loving. Yes. Yeah. And that's really um a beautiful way to describe it. You know, another person did describe the church this morning as loving too. Oh, awesome. So it's confirmation. So we thank you. Please continue to tune in. Please continue to be the fabulous fan you are and guests. And we thank you so much. Thank you, darling.